Welcome aboard for another video. Thanks, Conductor Keith. Hi. So the purpose of today's video is to do a comparison of my Mammon Bolton and my Pico General Electric 25 ton locomotive. Both of them are large scale. The Mammon Bolton is 1 to 19 scale, nominally. The Pico is 1 to 24 scale. I'm going to start this review by saying, you know, there's pluses and minuses to both of them. And as you'll see later in the video, they are both ideally suited to slightly different tasks. But I do want to start this video by saying I'm absolutely in love with both of them. However, if you're considering one or either of these locomotives, there's a few things you should know. And uh, the experience I've had now in running them uh, hopefully will help you. I have to do a throw out to Fabrizio Fiscardi, who uh, has encouraged me essentially into both of these locomotives. And I'm glad he did. I'll leave a link to his channel uh, in the description of this video. And Fabrizio, uh, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name completely 100% correct. I'm very gratified that Lord Michael, the chairman of the board of the Pencross Railway of Eastern Ontario, and Conductor Keith both heartily approve of these locomotives. I'm actually going to start by telling you what I've done to modify these two engines. Then I'm going to rate each engine on each of these categories as I see it, and this is purely subjective, and then do an average to see how they come out. I felt that this locomotive needed a little something, so I put the number 1000 on there because I happen to have these. Uh, and they're nice looking decals. And then of course I cover them very carefully with some clear lacquer so that they would not scrape off. I also added this blue material. This is actually stuff that you clean your glasses with. I put that on both sides for, you know, winterization of the locomotive. I also put some thin glazing on the front windows and the back windows. And it's put on in such a way that if I accidentally nick it, see it won't come off. It's just thin. All it does is just make it look a little tiny bit better. Given that the locomotive is made of steel, it's easy to drill holes into the feet of some of my figures and hide small but powerful magnets in there. So these guys just stand up perfectly in the cab. I added this horn from Swift 16 in Wales because the sound of this locomotive includes a horn, so it needed one in my view. I also put my Pencross Railway sticker logo there. But I think most importantly for my railway and my shunting operations and whatnot around here is... I took off the single buffer that was there. I still have it. I can put it on when I want to. And I modified these KD couplers to screw right back in there. Now, the reason for this is I can still put chain link couplers on there and pull them around. I happen to have some old number one gauge rail. So I cut some pieces, glued them on there. These are actually technically oversized. They're one to 12, I think, scale tools, like dollhouse tools. However, the thing about them is... You know, when you see real railroads, sometimes they have these giant oversized wrenches and tools and stuff. So I just put them there. They look okay. And the driver, of course, really likes his tea. So he sets up his teapot in the morning. And he puts it on there and on the hood of the locomotive. And it kind of keeps it a bit warm. The final modification I did was I found a spare O-gauge nameplate from a Hall class locomotive. And I just used dry transfer letters. Well, first I painted out the Hall name that was there in black and then I put Castleman on there in honor of the town I now live in. What I've done with this locomotive is I've added the KD couplers. It's a simple swap in and out. It's designed for it, which I applaud greatly. Took the shell off and all that, repainted the shell and put my Pencross Railway of Eastern Ontario logo on there. Also, I gave this locomotive a number four. I also put a figure in there. The first thing on my list here is weight. What do I think about the weight of these locomotives? Now, I don't mean just how heavy are they are for me to carry. I mean their weight and its appropriateness for pulling trains. Well, this one weighs quite a bit. It's quite heavy. This one, by comparison, is much lighter. This locomotive is 1.713 kilograms in weight. That includes, of course, with the batteries on board and the few extra things I put on there, which are really minimal. Now, the batteries on board this one don't come out. This locomotive is 1.038 kilograms in weight. Now, you might as well ditch the 0.038. It's one kilogram, and that includes with the batteries on board. This affects the locomotives in various ways. This one does not have traction tires. This has four traction tires. Now, being radio controlled, that's fine. They don't need the wheels to pick up power, and there's no center wheel pickup thing here, which is nice as to the look of the locomotive, which is a plus. I know when I've hooked up too much weight behind this locomotive because the wheels will start to spin. With this one, there's a forced feedback sort of mechanism with the motor, which I'll talk about later and how that applies to sound. And what it means is that when there's too much for the locomotive, the wheels won't spin. It just stops it. Now, all things being a compromise, 
I would have preferred a heavier locomotive with no traction tires. However, where they've put batteries in this thing and how they've chosen to do it means that there's only AAA batteries in here. And I use rechargeable ones that are 1100 milliamps. We'll get to the batteries later, so we'll get into it now. But what that means is they needed to save weight. I mean, it's one thing to haul rail cars around, but you also have to haul yourself around. So the traction tires are directly tied to the battery power of this locomotive. So what am I gonna say about weight? Well, with the Pico model, the weight plays overall into the design. Uh, it needs to be lighter. Of course, the weight plays overall into the design of the Mammoth Bolton as well, because there are no traction tires and it has a more robust battery and motor. So I'm gonna just say, I'm gonna give the weight for what it is for the Pico 80%. And I'm going to give the Mamad, we'll say 95%. It's a little bit heavy. Now I'm going to talk about batteries. This one has a battery pack that's built in and you recharge it with your recharging device by plugging in here. Okay, there's a plug. The batteries in here, I don't know what they are. If I were a betting person, they're at least 2,400 milliamps. Um, and they're bigger batteries. I've seen the battery pack. They're based on the same size as AA batteries. And there would be eight cells in there. Um, very robust, very powerful. This one seems to go and 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 go before recharging. I really like that. The only thing is I can't replace the battery. So if I'm in a situation where I forget to recharge it and I run out of power and it invariably will happen when you have a guest over, um, I, I can't just swap out batteries and keep going. So that's a negative downside. So there's a lot to weigh here. Good batteries, robust batteries, powerful batteries. Can't change them on the fly. This one, hard to do with one hand. I usually hold the top here, but it's easy to come out. This one, and also there's a button to press here. I'm trying to do with one hand. Here we got our little tiny six AAA batteries. These are fully charged right now. So that provides nine volts at 1100 milliamps. Easy to change though. If I run out of battery, no problem. I just ordered on Amazon a pile of these AAA rechargeable batteries. I've got a bank battery recharger for them and none of that costs me a whole lot. And the reality is I can just switch them on the fly. So I can run and run and run. And if I have a guest over and the thing dies, no problem. Uh, two minutes and it's up and running again, or, or maybe even a minute. So that's a plus. However, could be more powerful batteries. What they've done essentially is taken their existing locomotive and designed the RC within the existing locomotive. So in other words, it wasn't designed from the ground up for battery power. So if Pico, you're listening, um, I like this locomotive, it's a great start. Future locomotives, design something from the ground up for battery power and RC, and that'd be super cool. This one was designed from the ground up for battery. Well, the Pico, teeny batteries, 1100 milliamps is all I can manage in rechargeables. I think I'd get more power out of it for longer if I use alkaline, but that's wasteful. That's a 65. Yeah. The Mamad, well, nice, really powerful batteries, bigger batteries. Uh, they recharge well. They go on and on and on and on and on. However, I can't change them out. 80. Now let's talk about sound. So I'm going to put my finger in there and turn on the locomotive. That's nice. And on here, I'm going to turn this on. It came set up for two horns. I didn't like that. There's no bell. Uh, so I, there's no instructions on how to change the sound. So I had to troll the internet to figure out how to, how to do it. And it, and it came up with nothing. I took it apart. I noticed that there was a sound card with different boxes with things plugged in. And I figured, I bet these are different sounds. So I started experimenting. Again, not explained anywhere, blah, blah. But now number two is the air reservoir release. That's nice, I like that. The horn, that's pretty good. And you can turn the power off with that one. And it slowly winds its way down. So let's turn the power back on because I want to show you how it revs up and down. There's only one rev up and one rev down. So here we go. Revs up once. No matter how much weight I put on this thing, it doesn't rev up anymore. So that's not a plus. I'd like to see a little more revving. Now with the Pico locomotive, there is no turning on or off the sound with the controller. It comes on automatically. 
when you turn on the locomotive. It's a really nice sound, really nice startup sound. I like that a lot. All right. Then we have your bell. That's nice. Horn. Now you notice, I pressed it and hold it. It just does that. Hmm. But see, randomly and mostly, when I press it and hold it, it's like, but randomly, and I can't explain why, and I certainly don't know why, and there's nothing in the instructions, sometimes it's just momentary. So that's irritating. However, the rev up and the rev down is quite nice. And it'll keep on revving up. And it'll keep on revving down. And as long as you're going slow with no weight, you're fine when you stop. I'll show you what happens when there's weight on there. Another thing that's an interesting feature is that after 30 to 45 seconds or so, the sound turns itself off. And I guess it's a battery saving thing. Either way, I don't mind it. So when I'm doing something else with the other locomotive and I'm switching cars around and doing stuff, this sitting for a while and turning itself off doesn't bother me at all. I really actually like that. And you get it going back again by, you know, just starting to operate the locomotive. It'll turn itself back on. There are two things I love about this locomotive's system when it's under load. One is it'll rev up on its own if I put pressure on it. If I add more rail cars, watch. See? And then it'll go back down. I slow it down and it revs up. So it'll rev up going around a curve, for instance, because there's more pressure on the flanges and it's more, you know, and the locomotive has to work harder. So there's some sort of feedback mechanism between the power drain and the sound, which I love. I have to show you again, look. See it rev up? Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> it really is actually brilliant. One thing I don't love though, is under, when there's a lot of power being used and you slowly stop, It'll brake squeal and stuff. And the heavier the load, the more brake squeal. Only thing is, the brake squeal happens when the darn thing's already stopped. If it's inevitable it's gonna happen, it's gonna be a big, long squeal. Um, when it goes into neutral, toggle back and forth a couple times between neutral and forward or reverse or whatever, and then as the engine revs down, there'll be no brake squeal. I don't feel like you should have to do that. Another difference between these two locomotives and sound is this one has no way of changing the volume that I can see. This one though does have a little button up there and there's four sound levels and off for sound in that. So I really like that. So how would I rate it? Well, Pico, hmm, awesome sound. The brake squeal ruins it for me. The fact that sound revs up when there's a little more pressure on the locomotive. Say if you were going suddenly uphill, it would rev up despite you not changing the uh, RC setting. So I really like that. It's a great option. I love the sound of the bell. The horn sounds good, but sometimes it works on hold off and sometimes it's just momentary and I don't know why, I can't figure it out. If it weren't for the squealing brakes and the weird wonkiness of the horn, this thing would have 100%, but I'm, as it is, going to give it 70. You might notice that I wrote this on the wrong line, but that's okay, I corrected for it later. Now the Mammoth Bolton. Nice sound, nice on and off, nice sound of the air that I discovered, although I had to figure that out by myself because there's no instructions whatsoever about the sound. The horn sounds good, and of course it uh, stays on as long as you press the button. But the engine doesn't rev up much. There's no volume control that I can see, so I'm gonna give that one a 65. The next bit is realism. This is very subjective. This is a stamped metal thing. It's not based on a real locomotive. This is just a you know, like, nice wire. Um, it's got a bulky sort of look, you know, it's got some nice brass pieces, the side rod action is really cool. Uh, this is just metal pieces just stamped to put in there. In other words, it's not fine scale, but it looks nice. It's heavy, it has presence, but it's not fine scale. Still, it looks great, I think. So, subjectively, I'm going to give the realism of this one a 75. Whoops, in the wrong side. 75. Okay, now we're going to talk about the realism of this one. I really think this looks exactly like the real locomotive. It's very close. Um, now, the only thing is they've added a sound card and stuff in there, so they've raised the floor. So I had to cut the guy's legs off in order to get him in there, and that's kind of obvious. 
The light up in the cab used to really highlight the fact. I mean, it shone all over that floor. It shone around his legs and it just caught the eye to show that he's got no legs. Um, I covered it. As you can see, I put a little piece of styrene. I glued the styrene right on the tip of that LED light. It still illuminates around the cab, but it doesn't shine directly down onto his legs. So it's better. But I'm probably gonna have to paint the floor black. Given the fine scale nature of this locomotive and the fact that it had an awesome paint job in Union Pacific when it came, of course I didn't keep that, but it was a well, well applied paint. They could have put a sticker on the control panel. There were some dials or something, you know? I'm just gonna have to give the Pico an 85. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to pulling power. And as you can see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. There's 12 rail cars on here. It's not a small train. Um, it's on a curve though. And as we know, trains on curves are harder to pull. This train represents more, very likely, than if this was a real locomotive, it would be able to pull. Spun once or twice a little tiny bit. Okay, no problems there. Yeah, just no problem at all. Backed it right up. If my memory serves me correctly, I've had more than this number of cars on here by about two or three and then it starts to spin. I've taken half the rail cars off, leaving six. Six rail cars. Yep, it can do it. Backing up. Yep, you can do that too. You can do these six. My experience says when I get to eight-ish, depending on the weight of the rail cars, seven or eight, and it stops. It actually will start to rev up and then reset itself back to uh, neutral. So this is about what it can handle, which is probably even a little more than the real locomotive, especially if the rail cars were full. Keep in mind that the prototype, the real locomotive had 150 horsepower Cummins diesel. It's only 150 horsepower to pull all of that if it was real. So that's not, that's actually you know, fairly reasonable. Certainly it's more prototypical than the Mammon Bolton, which pulled, well, a whole lot more. All right, so what does it all mean for my rating for pulling power? Well, this one pulls probably a little more or about maybe a little more than what the real rail car could pull. Uh, anyway, it's closer to prototype than this one. This one pulled a lot more than it should be able to pull. But that also means that on an outdoor railway or somewhere else where there'd be grades, this would have a less problem hauling short train up grades and whatnot. This would have more problem handling more than two or three cars up a grade. So pulling power, I'm going to say, well, it's a balance because this one's appropriate for the type of locomotive. This one's not appropriate for the type of locomotive. But you can't scale down physics, right? So... This one you'll get a lot more power out of in any situation. I'm going to give the Mamad, um for pulling power, I'm going to give it 85 or 90. It's hard to say because it's not really prototypical, but I'm going to give it 90 anyway. And I'm going to give this one a 70, the Pico a 70. And now we're on to control. Well, these are both digital controllers. They're both really good. They both work exactly as they're supposed to. This one has the control knob for direction forward, you know, stop, reverse, stop, and the three easy buttons. It's nice, feels good in the hand. This one is not bad. Uh, I didn't know I'd like this one. I thought compared to this, I wouldn't like it, but I actually do. I think Pico's onto something with this. The only thing is it's a bit of getting used to is there's 14 speed steps up, there's 14 speed steps back. This is not so simple that this is forward and this is reverse, because when this is in forward, this is also to slow it down a bit, even if you don't want to completely stop it, if you know what I mean. Bit of getting used to, but I like it. Um, do I like this as much as this? Not quite. I'm going to give Mamad points for working with Fosworks on an excellent controller. I'm going to give the Mamad controller 100%. I love it. The Pico controller, I'm going to give it 90%. I really like it. Now, build quality. Well, this thing's a tank. All these parts are just solid. The build quality is amazing. It's got this huge, big, robust motor down there. Big, huge, robust brass gears. Um, 
everything is huge and robust. And I think that's the theme of this one. Huge, robust, heavy, hard to dent. This one, now, <laughs> these are not scale. This is scale. So do you take points away for this for build quality? It would be unfair, wouldn't it? because this is meant to be a scale locomotive. But yet, you can knock these things, it's pretty good. So if you're looking at a finer scale model, the build quality is good. This one won't break. So it's kind of a balance, right? So it depends on what you're looking for. Let's be fair. The Mammoth's build quality, I'm gonna give that, I'm gonna give it 100%. It is solid as a church. The build quality of this, you know, I'm gonna give it a 95. And only reason why it's losing five is, you know, if that was metal, Maybe it'd be a little more robust. You can bend something back sooner than fixing plastic that breaks, but it's close. So what does all this mean? I'm just gonna average this out. Believe it or not, I'm not surprised by these numbers at all. My overall feelings, when you consider all the categories, this is pretty close to my overall feeling about them. My Mammoth Bolton, which I love, 87%. The things I don't like about it, some of the sound things I talked about, it's not a fine scale model, whatever, okay? But I love it. I still love it, 87%, not bad. The Pico, 79%, well, that's close to 80, still not bad. But you know, some of the things I mentioned, the issue again with the sound, you know, four traction tires, the battery life, that's close though. I mean, you know, 79%, I still love these two engines. Don't get me wrong. I mean, these are good Mercs. They're not A pluses but I feel A-plus about them. I really do love these locomotives. One thing I didn't rate, but that might factor into your equations, is that this locomotive is dual gauge. You can easily, with a little tool, adjust the gauge of this locomotive to run on 32 millimeter gauge track or this 45 millimeter gauge track. Now I have both, so I find that very, very handy. This locomotive, of course, is only for 45 millimeter gauge, much to the chagrin of my friend David in Scotland. Again, I didn't include that in any kind of rating, but it is a definite plus. But now here's the critical thing, okay? This is the important critical thing, and I'll write it down. Cost. Cost. This locomotive, in my Canadian dollars, cost me almost exactly half of that one. Consider that. Hmm. Here on the railway, I do shunting. I follow this switch list, which I've come up with to make the actions as realistic as possible. This short passenger train leaves every morning before all the shunting work and comes back again. In the shunting work, I found that I'm sometimes pulling up to eight or nine cars at the same time. And what I have found is this locomotive is not ideally suited for the grand shunting everything in and out of the exchange siding. It just isn't. And that's after trying a number of times. This locomotive definitely is. So what we have here, we have two locomotives, like in the real world, that have two different purposes. This one is my shunter, to shunt everything in and out of here for operating sessions. This one is the train that comes and goes with the passenger junket to the next village. Well, they both work in their roles extremely well, and they both sound awesome. And they're both fun. That's the big thing. They're fun, fun, fun. Would I recommend either of these? Absolutely, I would. Listen to this. Ah, oh, doesn't that sound wonderful? Imagine this layout in the future as I keep working on it full of scenery and whatnot and the sound. Now the friar has found his new favorite train watching location is to stand right there on the bridge. And you know everybody loves the friar. Even though we know the friar has a vow of silence, he did hand me a piece of paper suggesting that he thinks you should subscribe, should like this video, you should comment because I answer all comments. I like comments. 
But most importantly, you should share this video so we can help encourage our love of this hobby and of trains. You'll also notice that the closer this gets to having the most cars it can pull, the gear noise starts getting a bit louder.